Today, we are doing a series based on legends and myths that um, come from the Bible. You know, and the reason we're doing this series is because there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of urban legends. There's a lot of myths that people get because they heard somebody say something or they might have read something or whatever the case may be. And we're walking around with incorrect truths. Okay? And so the, the um, purpose of this series is to help us understand just what is in the scriptures. What is the truth that we need to adhere to? And what is it that possibly is not quite in, is not quite correct as far as what we believe. Now, when it comes to urban legends and myths, isn't it funny how if there's something that we want to believe or we want it to be true, we will find a way to believe in that. You know, we've got all kinds of information at our fingertips now, and, and this is the, the world of memes. The first news piece of news information that gets out on the internet that's what we believe because that's the first thing that was read and it doesn't matter if three days later the actual truth comes out we believe what was already said right well when i was growing up we didn't have the internet but we had other means of finding things out and so there was a couple of urban legends that i believed in growing up my grandfather had this book on bigfoot and i was like wow that's cool there's this he, he walks like a man, but he looks like a gorilla. And I mean, there's all these black and white grainy pictures of him. Must be true. There's a book. And then there was another monster over in Scotland called the Loch Ness Monster. Well, I've kind of resurfaced some of my interest in these things. And I recently found out, you're never going to believe this, but Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster have been seen together. I mean, they're buddies now. I, I, I mean, it's, it's a grainy black and white picture, but it must be true because I found it online. Right? But, you know, that's how urban legends and myths get started. We, we want to believe in something. But, and, and by the way, I don't really believe in those things. But, but we want to believe in something, so we buy into it. Or maybe, maybe somebody that, that we respect you know, um, said something. And so we believe that, no matter what, without really looking into it. And so that's what this whole series is about. The last week, Pastor Dave started this series by going over the urban legend that there are many ways to get to heaven, when in fact there is only one way to get to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father except through me. And then we went over some, uh, a, a number of scriptures that back that up. So today, the legend or myth we're going to look at to see if it is true is all sin is the same. I'm sure you've heard that saying. All sin is the same in God's eyes. Well, before we go a, a little bit further in there, I realize that this very topic makes people uncomfortable. Makes me uncomfortable. You know, we're talking about not doing good. We're talking about sin. But here's what I want to encourage you. What we're talking about today is what does the Bible say about it, and what can we do to get over it, to recover from things, to move on and be who we're supposed to be in Christ. Amen? So the goal today is to give you a better understanding of what the Bible says about sin. So, in, in the book of Romans, there is a passage, and, and they're all going to be up on the screen. But in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every person on this earth has sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I wonder, could it be that this is where we get the saying that all sin is the same? Because the Bible says that all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. You know, without putting this verse into context, I would totally buy into that. But if we read the next verse, 
uh, verse 24, it says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You see, what this verse is talking about, this whole, if we read the rest of the chapter, it's talking about how Jesus became our sin when He allowed Himself to be nailed to the cross. He took our place on that cross. And because of His shed blood, we can receive forgiveness of our sins from Him and only from Him. That is why He allowed that to happen. Our sinful nature and all of our wrongdoings, no matter how much we mess up, if we keep coming back to Him, He will forgive us. He is the only one to do that. And so here's how, here's, here's another way to look at it. Here's how I look at it. Adam and Eve were told, don't, you can, everything in the garden you can have, God said. I want to have a relationship with you. You know, the reason that, that, that we're all here on this earth is because God created each one of us in a unique, special way so that he could have a relationship with each one of us. And that's how he started it with Adam and Eve. But he said, listen, everything here is yours except for the fruit on this specific tree. Just don't eat from that tree. Well, they did. Satan came along and tempted them, and they ate from that tree. So now, because of their disobedience, sin enters the world, and every one of us are born with a sinful nature. So fast forward into when Jesus comes to the earth. Here he comes. God says, okay, son, I need you to go to the earth to show the people who I am. Represent me. And so he was born of a virgin Mary, and he walked the earth, and he brought the kingdom of God to the people on the earth. He showed the people, he showed mankind what God was like, what God's character is like. He showed them that we have a loving Father in heaven who wants nothing more than to help us in life, to have a relationship with us. That's why Jesus walked the earth. Then, Jesus allows himself to be nailed to the cross in order for all mankind to have the opportunity to put their faith in him. This was, a, this was a big, big deal. I don't, under, I don't think any of us can fully grasp what took place when Jesus was on the cross. The sins of all mankind, past, present, and future, he bore for us on that cross so that we could receive forgiveness from him. When we choose to put our faith in him, we can then identify with who we were created to be and sin no longer has a hold of our lives. Amen? Oh, this, is the, this is the one line, if anything, I want you to get. When we choose to put our faith in Jesus, we can then identify with who we were created to be and sin no longer has a hold of us. You know, prior to our faith in Jesus, we weren't who he created us to be because we weren't living a life with communion with him. We weren't living a life in relationship with him. We were living our own lives. We were doing our own thing. And even though God created us, we weren't walking our lives out as the person he created us to be. So when we say, yes, Jesus, I want you in my life. I believe in you. Please forgive me of all my sins. Let's do this. Then Jesus says, now you're going to become who I created you to be. Now you will find your identity in me. And sin no longer has a hold of your life. Amen? So, with all that being said. Now, and then here's the other thing. Obviously, we're going to mess up. I mess up. I mess up. But here's, here's, how, here's, here's how I deal with it. When I mess up, I say, Jesus, please forgive me. Man, oh, I'm so, oh, why did I do that? I ask for forgiveness. I, I set a game plan up. To, let's, let's try it. Please help me not do that again. If I have to make amends with somebody, that's what I do. And then Jesus will walk me through it. He will forgive me of my sins because he loves me more than anything. And the thing that I don't do is let, as much as I can, guilt and condemnation drag me down. Because that's how sin grabs a hold of us. That's how the enemy keeps you where he wants you. When we mess up, we get guilty. And we feel condemned and we feel rotten and bad and ugh. And you know what we do? We don't come to Jesus. We hide from him. And 
Jesus is going, please, I can't help you if you hide from me. That's what Adam and Eve did when they sinned, when they disobeyed God. They hid from him. And that's what we do too. And I want to encourage you, when you mess up, because we all do, don't hide. Don't let guilt, don't let condemnation rule you. Get back to Jesus. Ask him for forgiveness. Because nothing is hidden from him under the sun. So he knows what's going on. So why should we run from him? We should run to him and receive that forgiveness. So, with all that being said, let's take a look and see what the Bible says about sin. Let's just get into it. <laughs> One type of sin is when we don't even realize we're doing wrong. We don't even realize that what we're doing is wrong. And the, the, the Bible refers to this as living ignorantly with the things concerning Scripture. Paul wrote a letter to Timothy. Timothy was a young man that Paul had trained up and sent him out as a pastor. And Paul's writing this letter to him. And Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says, although I, was a, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. You see, Paul, you can read about him in the book of Acts. His original name was Saul. He was a religious leader, and he hated Christians. So much so that he went door to door looking for believers in Jesus. And he dragged them from their homes, tortured them, caused them to renounce their faith in Jesus, to blaspheme the name of God. Because that's what he did. And he was zealous for that. And then, lo and behold, Jesus says, big surprise, Paul. <laughs> You're going to be a major player for me. And Paul repents, finds his faith in Jesus, finds forgiveness of all this. But what he says is, listen, I, 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 what I did was, I did it ignorantly. I didn't know I was doing wrong. So there are sins when we just don't realize we're doing wrong. You know, prior to putting our faith in Jesus, some people, we live very immoral lives. But we set our own guidelines, right? We set our own boundaries. Some are here, our moral boundaries. Some are here, some are here. Some are like way over here. In our minds, we say, well, I'm not a bad person. But you're not living according to Scripture. And then hopefully, somebody introduces you to Jesus, and you can figure that out. And then you're like, well, I did it in unbelief. I didn't realize what I was doing. And so that's, that's one, one uh, uh, type of sin. And again, this is why Jesus allowed himself to be nailed to the cross. So that somebody who's living an immoral life can realize through a friend or through whatever, you know, the gospel is preached to them and they put their faith in Jesus and man, one more soul is saved for the kingdom of God. When we realize the error of our ways, we can receive forgiveness and start preaching the good news. Another type of sin is when we don't do what we should do. James speaks of this in chapter 4. He says, he says, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, it is sin. You know, when we read something in the Bible and it jumps out at us and we're like, oh man, I got, I, that's what I should be doing. Or, whoa, I shouldn't be doing that. But we ignore it. The Bible says that's sin. If we know that we should be helping somebody, and we just put it off and put it off. Yeah, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow. Yeah, never mind. Ah, they can figure it out. The Bible says that's sin. When we know what we should be doing and we don't do it, that is sin. We may look good on the outside, but we're full of disobedience on the inside. And then, believe it or not, there are sins of the mind. This is... This is Jesus was, uh, this, Jesus spoke about this in Mark chapter 7, and he's hanging out with the disciples, and they're having lunch or whatever, and the religious leaders come along, and you know, in their pious ways, they see that the disciples didn't wash their hands before they ate. And they say to Jesus, they say, well, your, your disciples, they're eating unclean food. They're defiling their, their man. They're, they're unclean. Why don't they wash their hands? And Jesus says, listen, and then this is what he tells them. It's not what goes in a man that makes him unclean. It's what comes out. You know, it all starts with thoughts. 
from within, out of the heart of men, proceed, and then look, he lists all these things. And he just basically runs the whole gamut of things. And then it, all these evil things come from within and defile a man. See, our minds are very powerful objects, right? And we can think thoughts, and thoughts can come in from out of nowhere, and we're like, whoa, what? Where did that come from? Or we just, we do whatever we want. We fill our, we fill our minds with stuff from the internet or, you know, movies or music or whatever the case may be. And if our thoughts begin to control who we are, it starts to become a part of who we are on the inside. And then guess what? It comes out. And then people see that. We have to be able to control our thoughts. And the only way to be able to do that is to read the Bible. You keep your spirit fed with the Word of God. When those thoughts come in or, you know, something starts taking hold and, you know, whatever the case may be, hopefully there's some scripture, there's something in there that you can fight that off with. And these kinds of sins are sneaky, too, because they just start, they start small and then they get bigger. And then the next thing you know, you're acting it out. And you're like, ah, oh, how did I get from over here to over here? You know, we move our boundaries is what happens. And then we end up justifying that what we're doing, it's okay. It's no big deal. And then the next thing you know, you're, you're, you're lost. So if we can't control our thoughts, they will eventually take over. And then we're living a life of regret because what is on the inside will eventually surface and come out. Now, we have a couple more little examples here. Have you noticed how we're kind of progressing? We'll start with some easy ones and we'll, <laughs> we'll get... So in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, this is uh, sexual sins. They're on a whole nother level. Because the Bible says that they are sins against our own body. Now listen, you may... You may say, well, I got friends, you know, they, they really need to get to church and hear this. Well, if they're not Christians, they're not going to hear this kind of stuff. They're, they're, they're just like the first part that we talked. It's, it's living ignorantly to the script. You just don't know. You don't know how you're supposed to be living until Jesus picks you up, cleans you up, washes you off, and says, now you're who I want you to be. And we start adhering to the Word of God. But in the, in the Corinthian church, there was all kinds of sexual immorality that started creeping into the church. And that's why Paul also started the church in Corinth, and he wrote this letter, and he said, listen, you know, every sin that a man does is outside the body, but when a sexual sin is committed, it is to the body. And then shortly after this verse here, it says that the, Holy Sp the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's why these kinds of sins grieve the Holy Spirit. Because if we call ourselves Christians, believers in Christ, then the Holy Spirit comes in and lives within us, resides within us, and we, we our bodies are temples to the Holy Spirit. And then one more. There is the unforgivable sin. And a lot of times I know people, people read about this and they're like, oh man, did I ever, did I ever do that? Did I ever, did I ever commit the unforgivable sin? Am I, am I doomed? Well, if you've thought that, then chances are you have not, okay? <laughs> so, so let's just wipe that off the plate right now. If anybody here is like, oh no, that's me. No, it's not. Jesus drove a demon out of a man, okay? There was a demon-possessed man. Jesus set this man free. I mean, Jesus did miracle after miracle after miracle, and all the people were like, wow, this guy is the Messiah. They started figuring out who he was, but the religious leaders said, this, this man is of the devil. They actually said to Jesus, he has a, you have a Beelzebub, you are driving out demons by the prince of demons, is what they said. And so Jesus says, no, these are the works of God. And basically, when you attribute the things and the miracles that God does to works of the devil, that's the unforgivable sin. That is, your, your heart is so hardened that, that you don't even want anything to do with God, and you say it's of the devil. And that's what the religious leaders said to Jesus. And so that's why he said, you know, that's why he taught on this unforgivable sin, because the religious leaders were, were saying that he was casting out demons by the power of demons. So that's what that is about. So 
when we hear somebody say, all sin is the same in God's eyes, I believe that we just debunked that urban legend. No, it's not all the same. Sometimes we, we just we mess up. We didn't even know we were doing wrong. Sometimes we, we just we know what we should do, and we don't do it. And then, and then it just it progresses. There's all different kinds of sin. You know, if all sin was the same, for instance, how about this? I have two kids, right? I consider myself a loving father. I have a loving father in heaven. I know that he deals with me differently which each, with each different instance. If one of my children broke something in the house and then lied about it because they were afraid they were going to get in trouble, and then the other got into my wallet and lo and behold, there was cash in it that day and stole the cash, and I knew it, would it be right for me to punish them both the same? It wouldn't be right, would it? And so, so that's how God deals with us when it comes to sin. You know, there are different kinds of sin. It's not all the same. It's not all the same in God's eyes. So, so what do we do when we mess up in these areas? You know, because life isn't always easy. And a lot of times we find ourselves in a position or in an area and we're like, how did I get here? How did this even happen? Well, first of all, let's realize this. Sin is progressive. It starts out small. And then the next thing you know, you moved your, your goalpost, your moral biblical goalpost. You said, I would never, I'll never do that. And you said, well, think about it. Oh, no, no, I'm never going to do that. And then somebody says, hey, come on. You're like, well, okay, I'll do that. And you, you keep moving your boundaries, and then you're justifying your actions, right? Sin never fulfills the promise that it will feel better when we give in to it. The only promise that sin fulfills is that it'll get easier to do it again. And then we find ourselves in a rut. But there's good news in all of this. Thank the good Lord above. And this is what we'll close with. Remember, Jesus paid the price for all of us. When we're living outside of his ways, before we come into faith in him, before we ask him into our lives, we're running away from him. And he allowed himself to be nailed to that cross so that he could forgive us of our sins, so that he could clean us up, pick us up, wash us off, show us who we were created to be, and that sin would no longer have its hold on us. And he is for sure to forgive us every time we mess up. And this last passage we're going to read, I hope this helps you. I pray this helps you. Put it in your phone. Put it in your car. Put it on your mirror. Put it wherever you need to put it so that it gets settled in your heart. You see, a lot of times the Christian walk is one step forward, three steps back. Oh, I'm so rotten. One step forward, two steps back. One step forward, one step back. And then one step forward. Oh, my goodness. I got this. I'm reading the Bible. I'm understanding who I am in Christ. And I mess up. I get back over here with Jesus and I ask him for forgiveness. And I know he's going to forgive me. Why do I know that? Why do I hold on to that? Because here's what it says in 1 John. This is a small book way in the back. But here's what it says. There's three verses here. 1 John, starting in, chapter, in verse 7. Chapter 1, verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another this right here. Church. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. All sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Because earlier, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. If we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, understand this. If you struggle, if you struggle in your life and you get, you allow guilt and condemnation to, to grab a hold of you, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. That's the, kind, that's the reason my, my faith is in Jesus Christ. Not only because he picked me up from the rotten human being that I was and cleaned me off and made me who he wanted me to be, who I was created to, to be, but he offers forgiveness no matter what. He's always there. Never run away from him when you mess up. Run to him. Run to Jesus, because that's what he wants us to do. He knows we're going to mess up. That is why he allowed himself to be nailed to the cross. When we struggle with things and we mess up in life, the best thing, the best thing we could do is come to him. And come to him in confidence, knowing that you're going to be forgiven. Don't allow the guilt and the condemnation to rule over you. Know that you are forgiven. And you can even say, name whatever it is, or, you know, sorry, pal, you don't have a hold of me anymore. Jesus has forgiven me. He is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. It is who he is. He didn't put himself, allow himself to be on that cross so that we could run away from him. What that says is, you can't help me, Jesus. I'm too afraid to even come to you. I'll figure it out. We can't figure it out on our own. We need him. I need him. We all need him. Jesus wants nothing more than for us to realize who we are in him and then to walk in that power so that we can share the good news of the gospel to all those around us. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much. I thank you for who you are, Jesus. I thank you that your word promises forgiveness. I know that this is a, an uncomfortable topic. Some struggle more than others. But Jesus says, listen, come to me with your struggles. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He is faithful to forgive us of all sins so that we can realize who we are in him. I pray, Lord Jesus, that as we enter into a time of worship, God, that you reach down from heaven and you speak to each one of us. God, I pray that we catch that revelation that you are a living God who loves his children wants nothing more than for us to understand that there is power in forgiveness. There is power in knowing what our identity is in you and who we are in you. And I thank you for that, Jesus. Minister to us, Lord God, as we sing praises to you. And we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, let's uh, have our ushers come forward. We'll take our offering. So if you're here today and you're thinking, man, I need this. I need a Savior. I need somebody to help me in my life. Can you show me where you're at? Just raise your hand. Let me see where you're at so we can pray for you. Today will be a new day. Move forward in it. Your faith in Jesus. Is there anybody out there that says today? Amen the back. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else here today that I can't do this. I need, I need a Savior. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Over here, too. Anybody else? It's a three-day weekend for a lot of us. This would be a good time to have a new life. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Thank you, Jesus. i got a couple more things, too, but let's, uh, those of you that had your hands up, just uh, everybody, church, say this prayer with me. Jesus, 
I thank you for helping me realize that I need you in my life. I invite you into my life. Please help me to be the person you created me to be. I believe that you died on that cross for me. And I want to walk the rest of my life out with you. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, listen, for those of you that had your hands raised, if you would like to talk to somebody or have some more information, come up to the, get some more information about that. Um, could you come up and see me afterwards? Um, we can get some people to pray with you and maybe just kind of help you in this new journey in your life. And I'm telling you, it's an adventure. And then one more is, I, I just, I felt like there's a lot of weary spirits in the room. A lot of weariness. Life and, oh, and these kinds of sermons just make me feel bad about myself. And I know you said, don't let guilt and kind, but I can't help it. Listen, let's leave that here. Leave the guilt, leave the condemnation here. And let's pray as a church. So let's just, everybody, let's lift our hands up, lift them up to the heavens. Lord God, I pray for each person in this room. God, I pray for peace. God, I pray for confidence. God, I pray for forgiveness. And God, I pray that we no longer try to do this on our own. But Jesus, we come to you. And we use that passage in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. You are just and faithful to forgive us of our sins. No more running away from God. Run to Him. Run to Him so that He can bless you and love on you and heal you and help you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Whew, amen. Well, we, yes. Man, I love it when God shows up, you know? Um, so we're going to close with one more song. I just invite you to just lift your hands up, talk to God, let Him minister to you. Uh, amen. Precious blood 